is equal to another hash table. And what's interesting here is we can use dot notation. Typically in .NET, right, I would have to say, if I was creating h equal new hash table, I would have to use h, square brackets, and I'd have to put the key in a, in a string to get the value out. Here I can use dot notation, dot a, and then I can go after the c variable with dollar h dot a dot c. Okay? Um, are they mutable? So if you add, are they mutable? So if you add another item to that hash table after it's been declared, you can still use the dot notation? That is correct. Oh, sweet. You can not only, not only do that, but that's how you can also create keys and values okay. with the dot notation as well. Oh, even if it doesn't exist in hash Exactly. Table. So taking that up a notch, um, for those of you who are looking at .NET 4.0 with the new dynamic keyword and the new dynamic object that you can inherit from, people are beginning to write wrapper classes that do this for XML and as well as do it for hash tables inside of .NET itself. We've had, I get to say we've had that for a few years in PowerShell. It's, a, it's dangerous but really cool. So, and it shortcuts your work and it makes your programs more readable. So we talked a little bit before about reflection. One of the key factors about PowerShell is discovery. You know, you want to sit down to PowerShell, what do I have, what can I do? So there's a thing called get command. And if you're a Unix person, it's equivalent to which. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to say get command, show me every command that begins with invoke. Okay? Now, PowerShell is based on a verb noun concept, <laughs> verb hyphen noun. So if you walk up to something, you want to be able to do things like new something, I want to get something, I want to remove something. And the idea is that by naming, naming your commandlets, which is these, are these little built-in scriptlets concepts, by naming your command, commandlets that way, if I gave you a fishbowl, you could walk up to it and say, get me the fishbowl, give me a new fishbowl, or remove a fishbowl. So the idea is that people can leverage this thinking when they, whatever kind of set of commandlets they move to, they can see these common ideas. Um, and that's something you'll see that they're trying to really push to keep this language consistent. So here I want to see anything that ends with uh, anything in the system that has item. So here you can see we have clear, get, invoke, move, rename. Um, again, get command is your friend. If you sit down to PowerShell, you don't know what's going on, type in get hyphen command, and you're off to the races. So I just showed here, I did a get process, get hyphen process. And anybody have an idea what that kind of looks like? Yes, sir. Exactly. So now we have get process. We can we it's, we can use that at the command line. Um, is what is the type of that thing that it just returned? Is that an array of processes? Great question. Process info. Those are, process. exactly. Those are process info objects. So I can play around with those. Things. Absolutely. And I was getting right to that. Thank you. So the next thing up. This is the game changer, I believe, in PowerShell. I'm not only going to do a get process, but I want to do. I'm going to pipe it to where, okay? That's a where object built into PowerShell. You see the dollar underscore? That says, I want to look at every current object coming over the pipeline where its handles are greater than 700, and I want to sort by phys uh, physical memory descending. Okay? I'm not sure how grid view it is. Next, next. So, 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 hey, Sorry. so excellent, that's perfect. That. So yeah. basically you're saying the, it's assumed that the objects that are coming back have a property called handles. That is correct. And it's also assuming that that property is an integer property? No. Uh, it yeah. will coerce it underneath. But yes, it is assuming that the handles property is there. If not, this wouldn't fail. It would throw up a, uh, potentially throw up an error. But the PowerShell is designed to have terminating and non-terminating terminating errors. To try to get through as much as you possibly can in a script, so on and so forth. Um, so yes, if you throw in the wrong property for an object, you're going to have some weird results. Now, why why do you have to use the dollar? I'm assuming that the dollar sign underscore is whatever object was passed in. Exactly, why it's flowing over the pipeline. Okay, but and then in the sort, you don't have to specify that. You just specify simply the attribute being PM. The actual property that is correct. Right. That's that's a, right. That's exactly that's how. Um, depending if you're using a where clause, a where object, or a for each object, you have to get specific depending on what you're trying to do. Whereas things like sort and group uh, can just take properties and work that way. And what is the what is the squiggly brace con construct that surrounds the parameters to where? Good question. That's that's how you denote what a script block is inside of PowerShell. And you can think of a script block as a lambda, an anonymous uh, method that's being passed in. And that really what takes that takes PowerShell to the level of something like a JavaScript, right? So you can actually pass around you're actually passing around functions, which gets really and that goes back to the question earlier. Can we could actually even set that to a variable and then use it in different places? That script block itself. So what's the function on that? Is 
dash gt the function or what? Uh, actually, that's an operator. Right? That's an operator. Right, right. We don't. The problem, uh, the challenge inside of PowerShell is you can't. You don't use greater than it's sign. Exactly, because it becomes redirection in certain in other oh, okay. contextual ways. So they, it's a lot of hassle, but you have to use hyphen GT, a hyphen EQ. It's annoying, um, but that was that was a language choice they had but to if, do it. Yes. If, if handle set a function out, we could call. We could just dot it out and. Okay. Absolutely. So all the where cares about is that thing returns a bool. Exactly. So it's like a predicate. Right. Right. Exactly right. Okay. So. Let's hit enter on this guy. Hit the right screen. So that just now, what's interesting is, is that I didn't have to sit there and parse anything. I didn't have to count six characters to the right, handle white space, handle six tabs, anything like that. So there's no longer any parsing and praying like we did back in the Unix world. I don't <coughs> have to worry about somebody coming in here, throwing in a couple extra white spaces, or moving, changing my columns on me. I'm dealing with high fidelity objects over the pipeline. That is a significant change to how we can leverage this system. I believe, in my opinion. Not only could I pipe that to a file, just a note, I could actually capture that in a variable and do some interesting things with it. I can compare the, I can then use a compare object on it, which would actually compare the two structures. So I could do a get process, capture that into a variable, dollar $A, dollar $B, do the same thing, and then I can say compare object, see which things weren't running. So you can do some very interesting pieces with does, it. Can this PowerShell have um, regular expressions like Absolutely. It has the same, since it's based on .NET, it has the same regular expressions. And there's a simple way to get that working in uh, using a, what they call an accelerator. So their regular expressions are well integrated into the system. So here I'm just going to capture this uh, $A. So I'm capturing for the numbers 1 to 10. That's the range operator. And here I'm going to use another script block for each. And I'm just going to multiply each number in there by 2. Again, it looks similar to the where object. It uses the dollar underscore to capture the current object in the pipeline, and then we're multiplying by two. Um, this is similar to our map function in functional programming, just to toss that out. So now let's do a little more fun stuff. I'm going to pipe this to two different things. I want to grab, can everybody see that? I'm going to grab just the uh, even numbers and then multiply those by two. So I'm um, concatenating pipelines, and that's what that result is. Concatenating pipelines are like passing functions to functions, so it gets to be a real interesting process. I think I know the answer just because yeah. otherwise it wouldn't make sense. But like in Unix, right, if you have a pipeline. Ooh, Unix. Well, or whatever. <coughs> it, 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 when you have a pipeline, a pipe like that, uh, it's going to you know, execute the one entirely, and then it basically redirects the input and I.O., right? So they're not run sequentially. So if, if item, you know, if command one executes one item, you know, the second part of the pipeline is not going to get that one item and operate on it first. It's going to do the whole list first. Right. So this is using more like a yield return kind okay. of thing. Great right? question. That way? Absolutely. Okay. So the question is, will the, so if I can rephrase, the dollar A is getting piped to where, will the where actually process everything at one step and then pass it to the for each? No, it won't. But it all depends. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really use a yield return. It uses an, op it uses an object flow engine. And okay. so as these objects become available in one pipeline, the object flow engine starts to pass it down. And you can control that depending on if you're doing certain types of piping or depending on if you're using for each this way. And there's another way to use a for each as well. In this case, it's just every item going across. So if I was actually trying to do this command across multiple boxes, I could either say, go out and do everything and I'll get a result later, which is the, what you're talking about. Or I can watch results come back from every machine, which is a super useful <coughs> way to yeah, that's, sweet. That's, that's, the, that's what sucks about Unix packs, right? Exactly right. Actually, I thought Unix, well, slight digression, I thought Unix packs actually did send things. Um, yeah. I can't speak and, depthfully and on the pipes, that. The pipes in, in, in uh, Microsoft OS so as don't. Uh, maybe, I don't know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't think you would have to run them in parallel if it was doing that, right? Because you'd have one thing waiting for I.O., the other one writing right. I.O., and I don't think it's... Now, that's not true for all the different command lists inside of PowerShell. Like, if I pass this to a sort, sort the sort object command list will actually stop the flow of the pipeline. So you have to know which, which uh, particular command that you're using to get that kind of effect. So, but in general, it's just I get an object, keep passing it down the pipeline, and then the sort has no choice. Exactly, exactly. And there, are, so that's just to put out that example. There's other ones like that. Well, Question. it really depends on whether this, the command that can accept input coming in. Exactly, so. exactly. To accept that pipe coming in. Exactly, pipe. and pretty much every function oh. inside of PowerShell can accept the pipeline, with the, the ones that we write. Okay, so here's a kind of out grid view coming up. So there was a couple of questions before, and so I'm going to take the get process, I'm going to pass it to the select object, 
I'm going to get the first one, and then I'm going to use something called get memory. <coughs> Again, if you're familiar with reflection, I'm going to re get memory reflects over the object that I'm passing to it, and then I'm going to inject a GUI called out grid view. So let's take a look at what that does. I don't know if you can see that, but basically this is, if I went into .NET inside of Visual Studio, right, I'm just looking at this could in, in fact be my IntelliSense. This is all the properties um, on a get process object. The get process object that I pulled out was a process info object off of the system.diagnostics.process namespace. Now that, inter that user interface here, that's part of PowerShell? That is correct. This comes out of the box and I use this heavily. So if I'm trying to figure out what I'm working with in my, in my, in my system, I inject, I in put these little guys I do a get member on it, and I pipe it to out grid view, and I can see five of these things come up, and I can see what, what objects are being in play in my scripts. So let's move into working with XML. So let's take a look at, I've got this thing called, how many, everybody familiar with XML, or? All right. So I just got a simple one here. You know, it just has a nested products with some, some properties on it. Nothing too exciting. And we'll take a look at this. Can everybody see that line? So get content, if you're familiar with Unix, that's a cat. If you're familiar with DOS, that's a type. It just basically dumps the contents of a file. And then you see that little bracket in the beginning, over here, that's a, called an accelerator. There are several of them in, inside of PowerShell. What this will do, it will actually take that stuff on the right-hand side, the get content, and create an XML DOM document for me. Okay, so it reads it. We can look at the get type on it, and we can see it's now, I've now created, read that file, and I've created an XML document out of it. Are they supporting X document and X element yet, which are far easier to work with? Uh, they are uh, supporting that at the select XML level. Select type in XML is a new command line. It works a little differently than this, but you can do X path and work that way as well. Yes, correct. Um, so now, I can go back to the dot notation as well. So I don't have that file up, which I shouldn't have closed. So if I want to take a look at products, right? So there's my, I said $XML.products.product, and I'm actually listing out all the different products in, in that file. This is an array of objects now. So I'm no longer dealing with XML in the, in the PowerShell space. Um, and I can do some nice things instead of getting that, that I'm going to transform or transpose that image. I can actually print it out as a table. Now I didn't. I've done nothing. I use the same call. I passed it the format table. I did an auto size, and I'm looking at the data a little bit differently. Now I can ask some questions. Now this is a really funky looking for each. All right. So that's a percent sign, which is a shortcut for you for doing the for each. And what I'm doing is I'm using a begin, process, and end block there. So we've got a script block, script block, and a script block. And if anybody's used to awk, it's the same concept. You have begin, process, and end. So I'm just setting up a variable called sum to zero. And as I'm looping over the structure, the dollar underscore dot units in stock, pulling out that object, and I'm doing an aggregation. And at the end of the whole loop, I'm printing out the value. And so I just went through that list of units in stock and added them up. What is that percent sign? The percent sign is a for each. Okay. So that's like, and again, you, if you think about it in functional terms, it's a map. So I want to take this input and do a map to it and do some calculations or Could whatever. Could that be modified to do a running total as you're pumping out each item as well? I mean, it can, but easily modified. Easily? No. You'd have to take a different approach? Yeah. Yes, you would. Well, couldn't you use the middle block <coughs> or something like that as you're, as you're summing it? Couldn't you? You could, but it gets a little more funky because of the way the, 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 op, the running total is actually going to have to be calculated. You could, we could play around with that idea, um, but yes. You could do it not easily, and not the hard. And the sum variable is global? Uh, that's a good question. I'd rather not get into scoping right now, but yes, scoping inside of PowerShell is really weird. Uh, it's like ActionScript and it's like Ruby. You can actually define a, uh, it's a great question. You can actually define a variable inside a for each block, but it's actually script level. So you can get some really weird things if you're not paying attention to where, you gotta change your thinking a little bit when you, when you walk into dynamic languages. Those kind of things will bite you. You'll start getting extra results that you didn't expect. So. so now let's take a look at XML off the web. Hopefully I'm still logged on. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to go off to my blog and I'm going to pull down my RSS feed. Now how many, I don't know, so take a look at that first line. 
I'm saying new hyphen object, which is a commandlet inside of PowerShell. And uh, I'm using the net.web client, which is part of the framework. The next thing I'm doing is the $RSS feed. I'm just doing a download string on it against uh, a set of strings. Here you can see in the dollar feed, I'm doing the same thing. I'm using the accelerator on that data I get back, which is supposed to be XML. And here I'm just now doing the dot notation down the XML and doing for each on a title. Hopefully I'm still logged on. And that's how quick it was. That actually just went out over the internet, grabbed an RSS feed, and grabbed all the titles from that RSS feed. So, the common, so in a few lines of code, I'm leveraging the framework, I'm leveraging dot notation, I'm leveraging accelerators, and you can come up with some really interesting uh, capabilities. What happened with the funky characters in this? Good question. That's from my blog. Um, you have to get down a little deeper and start playing with Unicode at certain levels, depending on how your, your feed, what feed you actually go against. That's unfortunate. That's actually one question is, does this actually have, is this shell different than, like the regular DOS shell has like really crappy Unicode support? Does this actually This has great Unicode support. Okay, so it's not the same, okay. Exactly. I can actually go in here, you know the Lambda character? Mm -hmm. Right, I can actually paste that in as a function name. Into okay, the, cool. and start doing wacky things like that. So I'm going to start now jumping into some uh, Visual Studio stuff, but I'd like to open it up to anybody here if you want to talk about something, anything, any ideas you had, some problems you're having, if you've used PowerShell. How, how does it handle uh, environment variables? Uh, good question. Let me see if I can bring up another PowerShell without stopping my demo. Excellent. How does it handle environment variables? <coughs> Actually, that's a great question. It's a provider, isn't it? There it is. Um, I can actually change to ENV. Okay? So this is a provider, and now I can actually sit here and do DIR. What? <laughs> that's the best reaction I've heard all day. <laughs> you can do a registry too. You can do a registry too. Though. Absolutely. Yeah. So I can actually can change. Registry. I can go to HKLM. Yeah. And CD. Thank yeah. you. I'm going to try it anyway. Right? And now I'm inside that. What's really cool is I actually have tab completion. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take it a step further. I can do change to variables. If I can spell. Very <laughs> Nicely done. Let's do variable. There we go. Those are all of so if I created a variable dollar a equal ten. Come on. <coughs> There's my A, right? I can even do something like I can cat it. And so that's the provider model inside of PowerShell. There's several of them. Uh, we just covered a couple. There's one for functions. There's one for the file system. Uh, SQL Server ships with one, so you can actually do change directory to SQL. Then you can say DIR and see your tables. You can change into a table. You can see the columns. You can get all kinds of stuff. IIS also has the same facility. Question? Okay, you started up a new PowerShell prompt, and yet you still had dollar A. I, I, so crea I created it there. I cheated. Oh, sorry. It's not from the same. It's not like I forked the okay, other so one. Okay, so you're not. So the scope is not exactly. Okay. So I have a whole new app. Can you? That was the question from before. Um, okay. Yes and no, depending on what you're trying to do. Specifically in the invoke in the invoke command level, where you're doing it across machines, there are facilities for that. Absolutely. So does that answer the question about E and B? How do you actually use it? Um, I, I can go into this thing and do a terabyte, but how would I call one in a script? Let's see if we can do... So here's the path. I see, okay. We'll get really funky on it. I'm gonna do a split on a semicolon, okay? So that's one way that I use it. And actually I set up a specific thing in my profile. So if I ever wanna see the path, I don't have to see it all jumbled. I can just type in path and it does those six, 16 characters and I'm done. So that's one way, you, and you can set it, you can set them, delete them, change them, whatever you need to do. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on, uh, we like to go to? Do they borrow some more syntax from Perl too? Absolutely, well, there you go. Dollar sign. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That's well, alias question. system is quite powerful. Absolutely, aliasing as well. That's a great question, I mean, Microsoft Alias is a provider actually, I think. Uh, yes, I don't, see all your I, aliases. I don't think I really have ever used that, but I think you're right. There we go. Yep. So, you know, Microsoft looked at the, at the world of uh, Unix. It's a great concept. It's all about composability. You know, how do I put little units of work together? What's the task level abstractions? They, they, they leveraged that idea and they kicked it up with the object pipeline. Okay? 
question. I have kind of a contrarian question. Yeah. For what? Bring it on. <laughs> for what, since you're obviously Mr. PowerShell, when do you ever go into the regular command prompt? Never. Never. So ever. You never find the opportunity to ever go into the other command prompt never. ever again. And when I do, I take my, I go home and flog myself. But. <laughs> I have not, once it, I, it seems to, it seems to be faster if you're just doing directory files, for example. In in CMD. Yes. Well, that's true. That's a good point. Because you're not returning entire that's, objects. That's right? a great point. But I always find myself at the next step, right? Okay. I want to start breaking it down. I want to start doing for loops on it. I want to start pulling things apart, right? Um, I just tweeted last night, for example. Let's go to Go Camp, and I go to my C sharp stuff that I'm doing for, for this guy. Let's say I wanted to build all my SLNs in here, right? I can do dir dot star SLN, and let's do a recursive, right? Those are all my things. Now I can do a for each percent, and I'm going to say ms build. Nothing like an on the fly demo. Um, dollar underscore. That's how we know you know what you're talking about. <laughs> this is actually a PowerPoint piece of this. Point. <laughs> dot full name. Demo. And I'm actually building all my SLNs, right, with in a, in a few amount of characters. So that's why I try to stay away from the command line. So I'm, the way I, to learn it is to just turn off the command prompt on your PC. Anytime you want to reach for something to do with the command line, right. don't do it in CMD. Right. Um, and I would suggest not even doing it at the command line here. I would suggest bringing up a tool like this, which is the integrated scripting environment, right? Because I can do nice. Is that a free download? I'm sorry? That's part of the uh, out of the box. Is it right. the for 2.0? No. Yes, for 2.0. I'm sorry, I missed it. With, wait, this ships with what? I'm sorry. We can't this is all 2.0 I'm showing. Version right. 2. It ships with uh, this, uh, 7. Uh, Windows 7. Has yep. it out of the box. Out of the box, okay. Windows 2008, and as a download for back level operating OS's, even to XP. What did you do to invoke it? What did I do to invoke it? I clicked here. <laughs> Good question. You type in ICE, and that'll bring up another one for me. Um, Microsoft is still a GUI company, even though we're looking at the command line. But this is for people, like, you know, they talk about it for admins. You know, you don't want to sit there and click, 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 click. Every time you want to get something done, there's things that you want to automate. So there's a reason for <coughs> scripting and there's a reason for the command line. Um, but I would bring up the ICE tool. Here I have a DIR. On the bottom, I'm using a, the con a similar kind of console, right? And I can, uh, this is a full command line at this point. <laughs> Don't run from the room. <laughs> Parentheses are your friend. So that's the difference between a command level execution and a function execution. That's something you got to get your head around inside of PowerShell. We tried to get that state left parenthesis, right parenthesis. That didn't do exactly. it. Exactly. You got to wrap it in parens. And we'll take a quick thing here. We'll say test. We'll say dollar p. And I'll say hello. Dollar p. Okay. We'll run that up. Notice I used the comment at the first. It's a pound sign, is the comment in this language. And then I can say test. We'll run that guy up, it says hello. I can say world, uh, F5, that guy. Now, a lot of people coming from the C sharp world are going to want to do this, right? And we get an error. Okay, so that's another thing you have to get comfortable with is that it's not typical parameter passing, it's, it's called um, uh, parameter binding in this language. And it has different semantics. How does it figure out ambiguities? Like in other specifically. words, specifically. Well, specifically, like if I wanted to call test, but right. I wanted to pass into test as an argument the result of a function call, like on the same line. Great question. And then essentially, so I can then kind of set up another function. Because that's a problem with Python too, right? Yes, it is. And that's fun to work out in PowerShell. It's a little bit different, but almost the same. Okay. Um, so. With it doesn't execute, right? I just get the letter F there. Right, right. So then I have the A. Do we, did everybody see that? Should I go over that again? Mm -hmm. Not a problem. So if I, I'm going to pass the function F to <coughs> test, but if I pass it this way, it thinks it's the letter F. But as soon as I wrap it in parentheses, PowerShell goes into a different parsing. Oh, right, so it's more like, so parentheses in PowerShell natives are more like a, uh, a statement. Uh, it's a statement command level versus execution and, mode, yes, yeah, exactly. It's like an invocation. See, that's the question. Yes, yes it is. Your REPL do you know about? I'm sorry? Your REPL. Exactly. So, yes, it is confusing. 
we got to move to a different language and a different set of stuff here because we're doing far more than we used to. Can you like just go back to the get I'm, so, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. It feels more like a functional language. I'm glad you said that. I, <laughs> I think it's functional and dynamic. And the joke inside of Microsoft is that PowerShell has enough functional features in it to make it functional. <laughs> now, I wouldn't say that at an F-sharp talk, because I'd get killed. <laughs> but we're passing around functions here, so that's one criteria of functional languages. The other thing is, though, we're not, we don't deal with immutability, so it's not truly functional. But once we get to the function passing, we're in high-order level type computing. So it, 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 you got to change your thinking a little bit if you want to leverage the system and write less code that, that, that has real powers to it. Can you just re-execute the get date and days three? Sure. Let me just do a return here. Okay, so Hang when on. you executed it, what what decided what format should come out on the on, that it should come out in a string? Two that's two, the that's the two, two string. Two stri it, just it calls the two string by default. Okay. And I could do all kinds of funky stuff here, like I can even do dot hyphen f and I can do and I'm not good at my dates. So give me a date that I can do. Sorry. So this will work this way. Notice I got a different format right away. So that's like the format inside of .NET, string.format. And then I could do all kind of funky things. And I like can, can capital M, capital M, D, D, Y, Y. Yep. Can you y, 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 M, M, D, D. Oh, so the dash oh, that's F nice. or any string capital basically M. turns it into a, a format statement? That's correct. You can't use dot two string at the end of dot add days, dot three? Yes, you can. Oh, okay. At that point, it's just a dot .NET object. Capital Bingo. Letters. So let's just uh, prove that I'm not lying, because I often do. And there's a two string. We're dealing with .NET objects, right? That's one of the key integration points of PowerShell. That's why it's, I think it's, I like it a lot. And you begin to uncover some really interesting features. Uh, but you got to make that, that leap over shell programming and scripting and what are we doing. And then, oh, wow. I use this to test my components, which we haven't shown yet. Um, and you can do some really slick stuff when you start to realize that marriage. Um, you made a comment about less. You're yes. About because of the functional? Right. Right. That as well as the parentheses. Okay. So when you start doing some stuff with nested parentheses, it starts going like, well, where the hell am I, right? But you, uh, early on using PowerShell, I would get lost between the squiggles and the lack of parentheses, the lack of commas when I'm passing arguments to a, to a function. But when you get used to that whole style, all of a sudden you can start recognizing patterns in the code. So, and it starts changing the way you think. I used to do stuff in Lisp, and I would always hate the, the, the consistent, oh, the, the endless parentheses in that in the scheme, and it would drive me nuts. This is not as bad, but it, it borrows from it. Any chance we use composers? <laughs> That's the second question today. Sorry, we only have tab completion at this point. Um, I don't. I was out at the summit at Microsoft, and they would. All they kept telling me about IntelliSense was watch this space. So, um, again, right here, this ice, this this control up top, is a Visual Studio tw 2010 editor. So if you actually do some reflection on those particular pieces, you can see there is, there's some work already being done for the IntelliSense of how Visual Studio 2010 works. Um, but I don't know what, you know, Iron Python has it. I don't know why we don't have it. Question. Are you familiar with Saki, P-S-A-K-E? Pisaki, I've yeah. played with Pisaki. Yes, I know the author. It's a, it's a really interesting little make tool. Absolutely worthwhile investing time in it. Okay. Um, there may be other things coming online down the road for dependency management and make type tools. Uh, one of the guys inside of PowerShell, actually the guy who wrote the language, wrote one in like 300 lines. He wrote a full-fledged make system, but he never released it because he couldn't get it through a uh, unit testing type thing to get done. Question? So it's got all kinds of um, flow control. I mean, you've got ifs. You've got all the usual. All the usual subspects. Yes. The real While, thing. absolutely. While loops. Compiler. In fact, yes. Correct. <laughs> in compiler. fact, the switch statement is even cooler. It's something I've never seen before. Regex based. You got it. It's got a regex component to it. But even and even cooler, if I put a loop, so one dot ten, right? And I can say default. And uh, let's just clear the screen up at the top. So that didn't do anything exciting, but I've actually, I could actually sit here and start doing regex determination here, which I'm not very good at regex, so. Would I only pick out the ones? Thank you. So let's do that. And I'll comment out the default. And I lied. <laughs> I'm not that good at regex. So there we go. 
So, not, so what would we see here? Switch is a loop construct, it's an if construct, and it's a regex construct all in one. This gets really interesting if you want to write little languages inside of PowerShell, but we're not going there. All right? The CLS clear screen. That is correct. You kept making reference clear host. to reflection. Yes. Within this. Can you explain that? Because it's different than C sharp and that one. Okay. Uh, so maybe reflection is probably the wrong term. Um, let me see if we can get get member. Now, if I type in get member, member and I press F1, I get right into the help. Okay. So, um, so I can look at the properties and methods of an object, right? <coughs> As I go down, this is new. I'm sorry. What did you just do? You hit, you type get member, and, okay. and I press F1 on that ah, guy. Nice. Yes. So it's like the old VB days. Mm -hmm. um, so get member actually dumps the properties and methods on it. The reflection level is that you can actually crack open DLLs and look at the methods using similar techniques that you would, it's easier inside of PowerShell because you have more compact constructs, but it's the same approach um, that you would use for the .NET framework in that kind of reflection. So the get type and the get member is the kind of reflection, maybe I missed you know, a little bit too broad of a concept there. Yeah. Yeah. Or is working with Visual Studio, can I do things like type something and look at check-ins or launch something? Oh, with this? Yeah. From the, from the ICE scripting editor? Yeah. No. In fact, I'm working on a project now which is, uses TFS, and I actually wrote a whole bunch of commandlets for myself that would integrate with ICE, so that I didn't have to jump out. And, and I've done the same thing with Subversion when I use on my own custom projects. Yeah, I built up my own stuff to do that. It's not, it's, not, it's not out of the box, but the good news is PowerShell's about the last mile, right? So they deliver, typically Microsoft or any other vendor delivers something to you, and then within days you're like, how come I can't do this? PowerShell really fits that bill, right? So ICE, for example, there's things that it doesn't do, but I can just write, start writing PowerShell to do it. I wasn't planning to talk about this, but there's a thing called PS ICE. They've exposed the object model inside of ICE, so I can begin to custom it, custom, do custom things. Up here you can see there's an add-on. Oops. And here's a whole bunch of things that have been added onto ICE after it's delivered. So they, oh, and I don't know if I'm going to have time to talk about it because I deviated from my uh, talk. <laughs> but I, I hope so. Um, but this is what you can do inside your own C Sharp WPF applications. You can begin exposing the same object model and making it available to your customers so they can actually use PowerShell to drive these kind of additions. And it's not as hard as you think. Um, System.math, right? So that, that, that worked. worked. So that's kind of like a uh, that's kind of like a using statement. Yeah. What does the brackets that represent? Great question. So the brackets represent how you call into a namespace inside of the .NET framework. And notice the double colons. Double colons is how you call a static method. Okay. So there's a little bit different syntax. There's a little bit. There's different semantics. There's the idea of where do you use parentheses? Something you got to get over. But once you make that, that investment, the good thing about this, you make the investment in PowerShell, this is not going away. Uh, Jeffrey Snover was promoted to distinguished engineer inside of Microsoft within the last year. And as he says, it was more because of the direction of PowerShell. Um, so. So, the, so PowerShell is more than a shell model because you, you're looking for the .NET. At the beginning, I said it's an automation platform, right? And it's surfaced as a scripting language. It's surfaced as a command line. It's surfaced in a GUI. Right? It's an automation platform across all their products. And the idea is that everybody, every product inside of Microsoft is going to have PowerShell enabled capabilities. So that you can walk up and you can automate this entire process in a couple lines of code. What was the uh, largest Sorry. improvement from one to two? Um, remoting. Remoting and background jobs. So, uh, just really quick. So here's a start job, DIR. That's awesome. Okay. That just started a job in the background. I can say get job. Notice it says at first it was running. Now it's completed, has more data. And I can do this, and then I can pipe that to receive job, and I get the data. <laughs> and I can do that across machines. And on certain things like invoke command, I can even have a hyphen throttle limit, which so how says. How long does that last in the quote unquote job queue until you receive the data? That's correct. And then it goes away? So if you do another good job, it's gone? The data right now, because I didn't say hyphen keep on this, the data is gone, but the job is still there, and notice it says has more data false. 
So how do you get ready? You have to, you're supposed to delete the job? That's correct. So now I can say get job, <laughs> and I can pipe it to remove. This is equivalent to kill. You get, well, almost. It's not killing a process, it's just removing it from the queue. Mm -hmm. So that's all gone. What's really cool is, well, I think it's cool, is I can say do this, and then I can say wait job, get job, receive job. Now it's running, and hopefully, there it is. So I can actually set up a whole bunch of jobs. I can wait for them, and then I can get them, and then I can receive the data. Those jobs object, okay, that's your custom data type. I can say property, it takes a hash table, A is equal to one, and let's format that table, automatic. So I just created an object, which is a custom one with a property of A that has a value of one. So that's something along the lines that you're talking about. That's almost like a new class, newing up a class, right? It's got a, a new kind of structure. So you would typically use .NET to create your class structure right. if you need data structures. Right, if you want data structures, like right, you get, but then you have to make the context switch and then do it in C Sharp. Yeah, but you can leverage it. If you're an it. admin, you might not know exactly. C Sharp to generate your own classes, but you might be able to figure out enough to use it since you can introspectively look at the methods. So Good point. And that this is the recommended approach at this point until classes come out. So it's like an expando object. Actually, with exactly. automatic properties, it's, it's like an expand. not too hard to make the switch to PowerShell. Again, but then it, there, there is an interesting fence there with uh, admins that are willing, like admins typically sit down in PowerShell, their hair's on fire, they got to get things <laughs> fixed, they're trying to do some stuff and, you know, it's a tough challenge. But as us, you know, the ones that can get some time to sit back and think about it, they start doing that kind of work. Um, but typically they like to stay in the side of the scripting syntax and this is kind of the recommended approach to create your own object. PowerShell, I think it's tuned a little more towards the admin, but when you're throwing stuff over the wall to admins, this is a great opportunity and I think starting to put this thing in um, embedding the stuff inside of C Sharp and whatnot, it's really, it's, we're going to see some interesting development opportunities out of this. And it's just my belief. Handlers, we can expose out a whole bunch of maintenance functions on our application through PowerShell. Absolutely. And I wouldn't use the word maintenance. You'd be surprised how much we as developers need that too. And then you can let, absolutely correct. You can, you can explode your system in such a, and then if they have a problem at the admin level, oh, just write up a script. Yeah. And you're extensible, right? That's that last mile. Is there any tension between like the script languages that come in on the DLR and the whole power? I mean, Windows has always had this. I mean, it was seen as a failure that DC there was VAX and DCL and IBM and Unix had decent script languages. They didn't. And several years ago, it looked like okay, PowerShell, PowerScripts, how we solve that. Now, the past couple of years, it's been really Ruby and you know, Python. It's not great really question. Clear. So Iron, well, yes, and Iron Ruby and Iron Python again are tuned more for development languages. Um, you, they don't have the same level of integration as you have with PowerShell into the comm space, into Excel, or into SQL Server, and all those kinds of things, or in, even in terms or of the SharePoint. DLR. Or SharePoint. Yeah, I, 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 see, I see two really big things from this that I'm going to take away. Number one, um, programmatic configuration. Files. Absolutely. And number two, the fact that if I have a properly constructed like data access layer with you know, business logic and stuff, I don't have to write custom SQL scripts. I can enforce my business logic, but still, you know, if I have to drop into a shell to like fix something for Absolutely. a client or like look up an order, I can just use. Blend. And just to jump to... on that, uh, I was recently on a project where I wrote the. I had a choice of using SSIS inside a SQL Server to do the extract, transform, and load the ETL, mm -hmm. and I said hell with that, and I wrote my own workflow in PowerShell. Yeah. It was less code, more this... maintainable, and so on. There's a PDF. It's about 80, 100 pages. It's somewhere about a year or two ago. He did a whole. Depl was it you? No. It was one of the big yes. PowerShell guys. Okay. He wrote, it was about a 100-page PDF. It was for a bank and how they used it to do all their deployment. It was like a white paper. Oh, maybe. It, was that Hanselman? Yes. Hanselman, well, that's a great point. I don't know if we have time to talk about it. But Hanselman actually worked for CheckFree. And basically with CheckFree, if you're familiar with that, that system, they could actually go into a mom-and-pop store, one single machine, set up CheckFree to do all kinds of stuff with managing um, check accounts, bank transfers, or go into a large bank and do it. It used to take, in a large bank, three to four days to do professional services to set this thing up. He worked it all out in PowerShell. It went from three or four days process down to 11 minutes. That's exactly what you want to use it for. And once you start doing that, you begin to see, oh, this is a programming language. And yes, there's a lot of gotchas, and there's a lot of rough edges still, and things to get your head around, but yeah, it, it's what Unix people have been doing. The good news about PowerShell is it's great, but the bad news is it only gets us to 1970. <laughs> <laughs> so, but now we're trying to push this thing to see how we can take it to the next level. The object pipeline makes it. 
It's the game changer. It's a game changer. Is this, if you install just the OS like 2008 R2 core services, is this what you're using to configure it? Uh, I haven't done that on R2. The customers I work with are 2008. But okay. yes, we recommend it to everybody to R2. Turn on PowerShell, go to work. Because the remote stuff, we have 15 boxes out there. Invoke command across all of them. I can see tons of things that are going on, including the components that I install the services on that box as a developer. Well, I think that's all the time I have. Thanks Thank for coming you. out. I really Thank appreciate you. it.